it has been over two years since my beginner crafting video that most of you guys, if you're subscribers, probably watched. It is by far my most popular video and it is way overdue for a sequel. The intent of this guide is that you have already watched the previous video. You're aware of the foundations of crafting, item level, the basic currencies, and what we're getting into today is all of the stuff that's changed since the last video, all the stuff that's been added to the game since the last video, as well as getting into advanced techniques that I didn't cover in the last video. Between the previous one and this one, you will have a pretty comprehensive knowledge of most of the techniques that are used to craft pretty much everything in Path of Exile. Please let me know in the comments below anything that I may have missed, any advanced techniques or best practices that I might have glossed over or I didn't cover, and there will likely be an addendum to this video very shortly afterwards. Also, this is going to be a very long video. There are timestamps and table of contents below. Please go to whatever you're interested in. This is intended to be a compendium of stuff to go back to and reference in the future. And before we get started, thank you everyone over the past couple of years that is a patron, a follower, a subscriber of this channel. If you want to keep this channel alive and support it into the future, please consider patreon.com slash subtractum. And without further ado, let's get into it. So we're going to start off with what's changed since the previous video. First thing that changed is the Orb of Dominance. Used to be called the Maven's Orb, used to drop from Maven, and then they renamed it, and now it drops from Cirrus, Uber Elder, Shaper, or Regular Elder. None of the functionality has changed. They've only changed what it drops from. Next up are Catalysts. I still get occasional people coming into my Twitch chat asking about, hey, should I Catalyst this before I exalt it? And unfortunately, or fortunately, it just changed. Previously, Catalysts used to influence the percentage chance that exalts in a nulls would allow, you know, would make a mod show up. It would add weighting to it. So you could add like fertile catalyst for life and mana, make it more likely to exalt a life or mana modifier onto the item. That is just gone entirely. Catalysts are just something that you do to add a little bit of quality and boost the mods that are already on the item. Does not change crafting whatsoever anymore. And then the very big change is veiled mods. This changed immediately after, <laughs> after I made the previous video, but Veiled Mods before used to count as Crafted Mods, which meant that you could just go to your bench, type in Remove Crafted Mods, and just remove it entirely. That way you could safely add it with Ashling or with a Veiled Chaos Orb, and if you didn't like it, you could just remove it, and it wouldn't risk fully filling the prefixes or the suffixes, anything like that. You can see that it is no longer a Crafted Modifier, which means that if we end up with three full prefixes or suffixes, and the Veiled Modifier is one of those, then we're kind of in a tough spot trying to annul that off. The big change here, however, is because it's not a crafted modifier, we can actually craft modifiers onto it as well. So previously, this would count as our crafted mod, and then we couldn't craft anything, we would just have to unveil. But the nice thing here is now we can block before the unveil. So what we can do to influence what we're going to get as an option before the unveil is we can go to the item here, we go to Craft of Exile, click One-Handed Weapon, Scepter, and we can scroll down, actually the easiest thing to do is close all groups, and then scroll down here to Veiled Modifiers. Because this is longer, you can see that the text here is really long. We know that this is a prefix. A suffix is really short. Suffix is only like four or five characters wide. We know that this is a prefix that we're going to unveil, and we can see that by holding Alt over it. Then we can look in the Veiled Modifiers here, and on the left side is the prefixes, right side are the suffixes. And then we can look at the weighting of the different modifiers in the mod groups. So this is the mod group on the right side, the, these numbers right here and we can add up the weighting within those mod groups, and that's the chance for that mod to show up when I go to June and click Unveil. So for example, we see a lot of the number one right here, which means that I can craft any of these modifiers and it will block all of the one mod group mods, which means that I can craft one of these modifiers that will then block everything else. So I can mouse over this and I can see that at the very bottom here, you can see the, uh, the hammer and the uh, the blueprint icon, that means the crafted modifier, we can craft that and it will block all of these ones right here. And then we can add up the weight of all of the one mod groups and we can see that is the chance to block that amount of weight, which makes it much more likely to get the other modifiers. These ones that say NA unfortunately can't show up from a regular veiled mod. Those will only show up if it comes from doing a safe house or killing Katarina, something like that. So you don't have to worry about these ones that say NA, but all of the other ones can show up. So if we want something that is in mod group one, then it looks like we want to block mod group three, then we can block 1500 weight right here. So we can see that almost all of the weighting out of a total of 11,000 right here, almost all of the weighting is mod group one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yes, yeah, 7,000 out of 11,000 of the weighting is in mod group one. 
So that does mean it's kind of difficult to get something, you know, really influence what's in mod group one right here. And the more that you look at these, the more you unveil modifiers and you learn the blocks, you kind of just get the general frame of reference. So for example, I know that on a one-handed weapon, there's pretty much just two main mod groups. There's the Fizz mod groups. So we can see that all mod group three right here. These are all physical modifiers. And then the generic damage as well as the spell damage is all mod group one and they're all shared together. You'll get the feel for this. You'll start to learn that gloves, you always craft a physical conversion modifier to block the most weighting. On most items, you craft mana to block because you usually don't want to unveil mana. What we'll do here is we'll craft a physical damage modifier and we can do the lowest you know, cost one. We can do the, the cheapest one. And that will block all of the mod group three modifiers right here before the unveil. I'm Click on June right here, unveil mods. And then there's a very, very high chance that we just get mod group one stuff. And we can see that we got the lightning damage here. We got penetrate chaos res and penetrate elemental res. And that is basically what's remaining. Because we blocked mod group three, we see that what is available is mod group 23, 29, and one. And those are actually the only things that can show up from your unveil. We got one from one, one from 23, and one from 29. And that's pretty much locked in if you craft a physical prefix to block all of the mod group three mods, then we're good with our prefix. And then we can go back to the bench and craft something else. We can craft some spell damage, something like that. And then we have our crafted mod. And then the other big thing that changed is Ashling right here in the uh, as one of the masters from Betrayal. When you get her in research at level three, she has a craft when you kill Katarina that turns her into level four. That craft that she gives you previously used to just add a veiled modifier and do nothing else. Now, because that would be too powerful with the crafted mod, you could pretty much, you know, if they didn't change how that worked, you could pretty much guarantee to always get the mod that you wanted a very large percentage of the time. To make that a riskier option, now she removes a modifier and adds a modifier. So usually what you'll do is you'll use a meta mod, which we'll get into a little bit later, to craft suffixes or prefixes can't be changed to make sure that she can only remove a mod from at least half the item. And then the other thing that changed with the veiled modifiers is previously, you can see right here, it says chosen. That's a tier one prefix. It'll say chosen. And then the suffixes will be called of the order. So you can always hold alt to see if you have a veiled modifier on your item. Prefixes are called chosen, suffixes are called of the order. You can only have one of those at any time on your item. Previously, you could have multiple, you could have one on your suffix, and then do suffixes can't be changed, veiled cast orb, and get another one on your prefix. But with the changes to the way that veiled mods work, you can only have one at an item any time. So if you have one on your suffix and you try to generate one on your prefix, it will actually say cannot generate modifier. And I can show you an example of that in an expensive way very quickly. Just... So we have an open suffix right here. So what I'm going to do is craft prefixes can't be changed. What that does is it locks in, and we'll get into meta mods a little bit later, but what it does is it locks in the prefixes. They cannot change no matter what I do, as long as that modifier is still there. So if I try to use a veiled chaos orb, a veiled chaos orb has to reroll the suffixes, leave the prefixes, and generate a new veiled modifier. Because we locked in a chosen prefix, a veiled prefix, it will actually say cannot generate mod, and I can't use the item. So right there, could not generate mod, failed to apply item. And what that means is you just can't make a second veiled mod on an item. And those are the big changes since the last video. Most of them are just about the veiled mods. They work very, very differently after that rework in 316, 317. But they've been the same for a few leagues, so hopefully no big changes <laughs> after, this, uh, after this video. All right, now into the meat of the video of what's new. We're going to start off with how we started off the previous video of the currencies, the base currencies, and building up from there. However, you'll see that we have a new tab. Pretty much everything is here. There's a couple things in here that we'll go over a little bit later that don't really fit in this category, but there's a new tab here called Exotic in your Currency tab. If you don't have a Currency tab, do recommend getting one. It's probably your first thing that you buy, but you'll see that these are all brand new. Pretty much all of these are brand new since the previous video, so we got a whole bunch of stuff to go over. The only currencies that existed in the previous video were these ones, the Conqueror Orbs, the Orb of Dominance, previously the Maven's Orb, and the Awakener's Orb. So one of the biggest changes that happened in the past two years is they added a new set of influences. These are the Eater of Worlds influences as well as the Searing Exarch influences. So our previous influence items, as you can see right here, we have Shaper and Warlord. These influences are mutually exclusive with the new Eldritch influences, which are the Searing Exarch and Eater of Worlds. Those are the Eldritch ones and the other ones are the Conqueror ones, including Shaper and Elder as well. So there's no way to mix and match these. If you have Eldritch influence on your item or you have Conquer influence on your item, 
they cannot interact whatsoever, which also means that a conqueror influence item does not get access to the new Eldritch currency, which we'll be getting to in just a second. So Eldritch influence comes from running maps that have Eldritch influence. <laughs> Clear enough. We have Searing Exarch here as well as Eater of Worlds. They, I'm not going to get into all the stuff that they do in the game, but the general idea is by killing monsters in those maps, by killing the bosses, you can get items that either drop already influence or you can get these items that let you manipulate the influence on those items. What these influences do is they set their own implicits. These currently only work on armor items in the game. So helmet, body armor, boots, gloves, and shields. And to demonstrate what they do is you can use this currency on a either already influenced item, only Eldritch influence. You'll see it does not work if I try to click it on a conquer influence, failed to apply item, item has influence. However, on a non-influence item or already Eldritch influence item, I can use one of these Ickers or Embers, which have up to four tiers. We see that they have Lesser, Greater, Grand, and Exceptional. There's also two more tiers in addition to this called Exquisite and Perfect. What I can do is put it on this item and you'll see that it added a new implicit on the item. If we hold Alt here, it says Eater of Worlds Implicit Modifier Lesser. That's how we know we used a Lesser Eldritch Icker to give this a Eater of Worlds influence. And the nice thing is we can have one of both. So then we can also use a lesser Eldritch Ember instead of the Icker. And you'll see it'll add a little red glow to the outside. We get a little blue and a red. That's how you know it has both of the influences on it. And then we can see Searing Exarch Implicit Modifier lesser. And if we wanna see what we have a chance of getting, we can go to Craft of Exile again, go to Body Armor, Strength, scroll to the bottom, and then we can see the Searing Exarch and Eater of Worlds implicits. So these are the list of the implicits that we get, and you'll see that they also have different weightings. So there is a different weight for what we can get, and some of them can be harder to get and annoying to get. Um, and like I said, there are different tiers based on which currency that we use going up to exceptional that we can click on this, and you can see, oh, there's actually six different tiers. So this is lesser, greater, grand, exceptional. And so for this modifier specifically, we can see the weightings and we can see the possible roles that we can get by spamming it with the own currency that we have. We'll also see that there's versions of many of the mods that say Pinnacle Atlas Boss in your presence or Unique Enemy in your presence. These ones will be significantly stronger, but are not active all the time. Unique Enemy will be a little bit stronger and then Pinnacle Atlas Boss, which is even more restrictive, will be even stronger. And that's really the first steps of interacting with Eldritch Implicits and Eldritch Influence is just use these currencies, buy them, spam them until you get the modifier that you want and you can just use the item and you're good to go. If you want the better version of the modifiers, you can go for the more expensive currencies going up to exceptional. Exceptional only drops from bosses, so these ones are usually much more expensive. Uh, grands and below can drop from regular map encounters. However, if we remember, there are two more tiers of the modifiers. And the only way to get those tiers is to use something called the Orb of Conflict. This item has a varying price in the economy, but it can very quickly get pretty expensive later on in a league. What it does is it unpredictably raises the strength of one modifier and lower the strength of another. And this is influenced by the tier of the modifiers relative to each other. So if they are both the same tier, it's a 50-50 chance which one it's going to pick. If there is a difference, there is a, an additional 11% difference that it will choose the lower one. So the more that you're trying to raise one of them, the more likely it's gonna pick the other one and try to bring them into equilibrium. And so for example, if you have a tier five and a tier three item, it's actually a 28% chance only of upgrading that five up to tier six. So if you have a tier five item, you would really like to get that other mod up to tier four if you can, makes it easier to get that tier five up to tier six. Getting all the way up to tier six, getting a perfect modifier, can get very expensive, and unless you're going for absolute min-max, this is not a very common thing that people do. The other thing to note is some modifiers actually have breakpoints right here. Here, perfect example. So we can see that the max fire resistance on a body armor actually has two tiers of one, two tiers of two. So even though you win one orb of conflict, you will see no change. So what we can do to show as an example is I will roll a grand right here. So we can see that we have a tier one searing exarch and a tier three, which is grand, of the Eater of Worlds. And then when I use an Orb of Conflict, one of these will go up and one will go down. Most likely, the Searing Exarch will go up because it's a lower tier and it's gonna try to bring that into equilibrium. Let's see what happens. And there we go, that's exactly what happened. So the Chaos Damage went from tier one to tier two and the Mana Recovery Rate went from tier three to tier two. And now they're both tier two. And to show you guys that there are tiers higher than, <laughs> than uh, just tier four, I'm gonna use my only 
exceptional Searing Exarch Ember right here. So we can see that both of these are exceptional. Both of these are tier four. So one of them will go to tier five and the other will go to tier three. All right, so we have Exquisite right here. Eater of Worlds is now Grand, which is great for me. So to influence this, right, because now we don't have the best chance to get that Exquisite up to perfect because the Grand is two tiers lower, right? Remember, this is only a 28% chance because this is the 5-3. To make this a better chance for us, we actually want to now use an Exceptional Eldritch right here. Brings that Searing Exarch up to Exquisite, and now I have a better chance that Exceptional will go to perfect. And now, fingers crossed. And it didn't work. <laughs> All right, and fingers crossed. Nope. So now we have Exquisite on the Searing Exarch and Exceptional on the Eater of Worlds, which is fine. We'll try again. Exceptional Exquisite again. And Grand Perfect. There we go. Perfect does exist. <laughs> it would not be possible to get two tier sixes because one of them has to go lower to get the other one to go higher. And that is manipulating the Implicits. Now, what else do these Eldritch Implicits allow us to do? Well, some very, very cool stuff. There are three new currencies that we have that are based on previous currencies that allow us to influence only part of an item based on the tier of the Eldritch influence. So by looking at this item, we know that we have a tier six perfect Eater of Worlds and we have a tier three grand Searing Exarch. That means that the perfect, the Eater of Worlds, is dominant. It is the higher tier. If we look at the Eldritch currency, we can see that it does different things based on what's dominant. And this allows us to interact with only prefixes or only suffixes at a time, which means that we can craft an item with a lot more influence over it. We can go for perfect suffixes and then only interact with the prefixes just one at a time. It's very cool. And as we just saw, we can change the tiers to go entirely for the prefixes, change the tier, and then go only entirely for the suffixes afterwards and vice versa. We can switch that around however we like. So what this is, this is a chaos orb, an orb of annulment, and an exalted orb. They do the exact same things that the default normal currencies do, except they only influence the one side. They essentially pretend that only one of these sides exists at a time, so they're just interacting within just that bucket of prefix or suffix. Prefixes are Searing Exarch. Red is the, the top one, the stronger one. The subordinate one <laughs> is the Eater of Worlds. Blue is the suffix. Unfortunately, on the prefixes, sometimes Eater of Worlds can show up first, so make sure you read it out loud. In this example, it does put it in the right order, Searing Exarch, then Eater of Worlds. Sometimes those can be in a different order, so be very careful about that. We can see that we have Tier 6 Eater of Worlds, so that means that this currency will only interact with the suffixes of the item. So, for example, if I have perfect prefixes, I love these prefixes. Tier 11 life, mm, that's exactly what I wanted <laughs> for my body armor. That's what we're looking for. But we don't love these suffixes. So the cool thing that we can do here is just to interact with the suffixes, you know what? Maybe I like tier five lightning res. Here's what we can do. Remembering all the stuff from previous crafting knowledge, we're interacting with just the suffixes. And what we can do is we can say, hey, I got lightning res already on the suffixes and I really want to get either strength and another res. That would be great. What can I do? I can actually craft additional physical damage reduction. We can see that this is weight 5,000. We can craft this and use an Eldritch Exalted Orb and give us a very, very high chance of either hitting strength or one of our resistances. There is a good chance that we get <laughs> life regen. That's the meme. We could get life regen right here. It is a very, very high weight. But the best thing that we can do to give us a good chance of getting a resist is to craft physical damage reduction because we can actually block this. We can see we can craft this right here. Because we mouse over this mod group, we see the little hammer symbol. That means it's a craftable mod. Then we can see that we can block 5,000 weight. And then all we have left is strength or res and then life regen. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to craft physical damage reduction right here. Craft the cheapest one. And then using an Eldritch Exalted Orb, we have a 17,500 weight to get, uh, get, to get a res. 9,000 weight of strength and 11,000 weight to get life regen. So we're most likely going to get res, but there's a good chance that we get strength or life regen. It's only on suffixes, so we know we can only interact, you know, we're only interacting with the suffixes because the Eldritch suffix is actually full. This is a better example, I think. We have an open prefix right here. I, mm, tier 11 life, we still got it. Beautiful. <laughs> um, and we have strength. And what we want to do is, again, we really want to get a resist, and now we also have lightning res that's open. This is the exact same situation. Strength is blocked. We want a res. We crafted additional physical damage reduction. We're either going to get, no matter what, life regen or a resist. And the cool thing here is because we're using an Eldritch Exalted Orb, we are guaranteed to get a suffix. 
even though we have an open prefix, maybe we want to keep that open for something later in the crafting process. We can leave that open and just use an Eldritch Exalt and hopefully we get a res. Look, we got Lightning Res back. And if I try to use another Eldritch Exalted Orb, we'll see that it says item has no more space for mods. Even though I'm trying to use an Exalted Orb, because it's only interacting with suffixes, it's only looking at that one half of the bucket right there, it doesn't care about the prefixes, it cannot interact with them. Now conversely, what if I really don't like that strength? Oh, that strength is bad. I don't want that whatsoever. So I can remove a crafted mod and I can make this a 50-50 to remove strength or lightning res with an Eldritch and Null. The Exalt and the Chaos are great, but I really think the power here is the Orb of Annulment because normally it's really risky. You're doing your crafting for your item. You're gonna fill your prefixes or suffixes. I don't wanna risk losing one of the other ones if you just wanna interact with suffixes and you have perfect prefixes. The nice thing here is you can just change your dominance to Eater of Worlds guarantee that you can just use this currency to interact with suffixes only and protect your prefixes without spending two divines, a pop on meta mods, anything like that. So I can go for a 50-50 right here to try to remove the strength or the lightning. Ah, uh, we removed the lightning res. And then it can get very degenerate where you can go back here, craft back on physical damage reduction and exalt again. And okay, well, tier eight fire res, not so good. <laughs> and that's the basic flow right here. Now there is a third item that is the Eldritch Chaos Orb. And this does the exact same thing. It's a full Chaos Orb, full reroll, but only for the suffixes or the prefixes. So Eldritch Chaos Orb right here, I'm guaranteed to only roll the suffixes and I can use this until I get, you know, one or two suffixes that I'm very happy with without risking losing anything on my prefixes. And instead of crafting, you know, prefixes can't be changed every single time using a Chaos Orb like that. We can just use the Eldritch one and it saves us a lot of currency, you know, rolling an item, you know, 50-50. We usually craft an item suffixes first or prefixes first and do the other one. All right, so that is the power of Eldritch influence and Eldritch currency. There are so many implications with this. Many of them come with the power of meta mods, which is going to be a very big part of this video, that which will be coming later. But I wanted to go over this first because this is probably the biggest single change that we've gotten so far since the previous video. It is two whole new sets of influence that give us very, very powerful implicits on our items, as well as the ability to craft only half at a time, which is very, very powerful. All right, next up, very, very simple are sacred orbs. So these guys right here, this is actually the second rarest currency in the game. <laughs> Crazy enough, it's actually three times rarer than a divine orb, as said by Chris. But you can see that people don't really care that much about it. It only goes for 40 chaos because all that it does is it re-rolls the inherent modifiers on a defensive item. So we'll see right here is it says armor. This will apply to armor, ward, energy shield, and evasion. Items will come with this inherent value that will modify, which sets the base value that then gets modified by things like the increased armor right here. So the actual armor on this item is 682. That is then increased by 53%. So we can use the sacred orb to influence this roll within this range and try to get up to 691 to get a perfect item. So for most people, most of the time, it's not the biggest deal, but you do want to look out for better rolls, especially if that is a primary defensive layer for you. It can mean the difference of like a full thousand evasion or thousand armor on an item, especially if you're stacking a lot of prefixes that are scaling that value on the item. And just to demonstrate using this, you will see, we'll see that I'm probably gonna make this item worse. I will go from 682 to, okay, all right. Sometimes lucky, just for the recording luck. Now we hit a perfect item and we'll see that we now have 1,057 armor. We got a little bit more. So that is the sacred orb. All right, next up are tainted orbs. This one's gonna be fun. These are very, very powerful. They were added in Scourge League and they're pretty awesome. Some of them do some really crazy stuff, but most of them are just good for getting your sockets. That's actually the main thing that we care about is getting your sockets all sorted. So what tainted orbs do is they only interact with corrupted items. So you can't use it on a non-corrupted item. It'll say target is not corrupted. It works a little bit differently than the defaulted version that is based on. So a tainted jeweler or a tainted fusing orb actually, instead of just re-rolling the whole item, makes it go up or down. So if you have four link sockets and you use a tainted orb of fusing, it will either go to five link sockets or three link sockets, assuming that you have enough sockets on the item. Same thing with a tainted jeweler's orb. So this is actually the most powerful way especially early league to get your six link. We saw this league at time of recording, 3.22 Ancestor League, Tainted Orbs of Fusing were going up to 100 to 150 chaos at the beginning of the league because people recognized how powerful these were. But the price went down very, very quickly 
And at time of recording, it's down to nine chaos per. So usually what you want to do is you vol your item. You know, you'll usually start with a corrupted item. You could buy a six socket, five link body armor. That's really good for your build early league for very, very cheap. And then you want to make that a six link. The way you would do that is with tainted jewelers and tainted orbs of fusing. So I'm just going to show you guys the, uh, the correct way to do this right now. So we can see that on a corrupted item, we can actually still interact with sockets, but the cost will actually also gain a vol orb cost on top of the base cost equal to the amount of currency that you would spend. So if I want to get six sockets on my item, normally it would be 350 jeweler orbs because the item is corrupted. It's also 350 vol orbs, which is very expensive. However, what we can do, and if we look at the cost, you know, you want to check the cost. We can see it's about two chaos per tainted jeweler's orb. What we can do is craft four sockets on the item. So we only spend 10 vol orbs, not too expensive. Then we use a tainted jewelers and we try to go up to five and we failed there with the tainted jeweler so cheap. We'll actually just use a tainted jeweler again. And we hit four. Now we hit five. And now we went back to four, five. And we're just gonna do this till we hit six. However, if I went down to two sockets, I would recraft four sockets and then keep going with the tainted jewelers because the vol orb cost gets so low that it's actually worth just using these. It's worth using the cheaper crafts instead of just using the tainted orb. However, with links, the price goes up significantly. So we can see that four link sockets is actually really cheap. However, for five linked, it goes to 150 and then six is 1,500. And that is way too many vol orbs for us. So what we're gonna be doing is crafting four link sockets and then using a tainted orb of fusing until we hit a six link. So we see that we went back down to a three link here. So we actually recraft four link, then tainted or refusing back to three, go again, back to three, go again, five, five, back to four, back to three, recraft four. All right, so much for that luck. Five and six, nope. Four, three, craft four, <laughs> five and nope, nope. We might go through all these before I finish. Okay, there we go. <laughs> we got a six link. You can get, there we go. That shows how exceptionally unlucky you can get. Early league when these are more expensive and vol orbs don't cost that much, it's probably better to just craft five link sockets with the 150 vol orbs and then use a single tainted orb refusing. But you know, you always want to check the price at only nine chaos per. It's worth just crafting the four link and then going up to six. So this is the by far most common tainted craft that is being used. The other thing you can do is tainted blacksmith and tainted armor scraps. These are beautiful. I absolutely love these. So you can use these to go up to 29% quality. It doesn't go to 30, but it goes to 29% quality. Uh, it can go to 0% quality though. So I usually just spam this until I get to like 25 plus something like that. And then we can also use uh, blacksmith on our weapons, a lot more armor, a lot more damage, basically for free. If you just find like a nice corrupted 0% quality item, you can just toss these on. These are very, very cheap usually. Next up is the Tainted Chromatic Orb. I love these. Unpredictably reforges the color of sockets on a corrupted item. The nice thing about this is it just does any colors. So for example, this is a strength item. This is 160 strength, which means that it's very difficult with a Chromatic Orb to get non-red sockets. Blue is intelligence and green is dexterity. So we're almost always just going to get red sockets. So if I just want to get three green sockets, right? And I, if I'm just doing like one green at a time, I can click a lot. And it's really unlikely for me to get three green sockets because this is a strength base and it can get really expensive because again, it also costs the vol orb. So every time I do that, it's costing me four vol orbs in addition to the four chromatics. And that, that's no bueno. If I want just off colors, if I want at least three green sockets, I don't care about the other ones. A tainted chrome is just gonna be the way to go. These do end up being pretty cheap. It looks like currently a time of recording. They're about seven to eight chaos per, and the price is going down as I talk. So if I just want three green sockets, all right, just one of them. There we go. Because it is entirely ignoring the stat requirements on the item, and it's just full random everything. And this is a great way to get many off colors on your item. And now we're getting into wacky territory. These are currencies that aren't used very often, but we'll go over them very quickly. So Tainted Exalted Orb unpredictably adds or removes a modifier on Corrupted Rare Item. That's all it does. As far as I know, it's a 50-50. It just adds one or removes one. It's a random exalt on a corrupted item. Let's see what this does. It removed the mod. There we go. Because you can't craft mods afterwards because it's already corrupted, this is a very, very weird item that, you know, you can definitely craft some stuff on it. There's options to do some really wacky stuff with it. This is a pretty rarely used currency in the game. Next up to go along with it, Tainted Chaos Orb. 
unpredictably reforges a corrupted rare item with new random modifiers or removes all of its modifiers. So this is a very, very cheap item, five chaos per right now, because it's just a full chaos orb on an already corrupted item. If you have a corrupted six link early Lee, you could spam some tainted chaos and try to get something good, but these are pretty weird. Um, there we go. We made a white item. Congratulations. <laughs> Here's the kicker is once the item goes white because the chaos orb only interacts with rare items, you actually can't do anything with it anymore. It just hard bricks the item and you're stuck with a white corrupted item. <laughs> That's why I showed the exalted orb first because we can't use the exalted orb afterwards. And actually I should have shown the teardrop first. So let me get another item to, uh, to show that off with. So what the tainted divine teardrop does is it unpredictably raises or lowers the tier of each modifier on a corrupted rare item. Now this one actually has some really interesting hidden value. So if you craft an item that, for example, might have a very common tier two modifier, but it's hard to get tier one on it, you can, you know, for example, a bow that has plus two arrows, right? A bow like this, you'll see the of many. The bow attacks fire two additional arrows is very hard to hit, but the bow attacks fire one additional arrow is not that hard to hit. And I can show that in Craft of Exile real quick. Bow fires one additional arrow is a 1,000 weight, but two arrows is a 100 weight. It goes from 1.3% to 0.13%. So you can find bows that might have some really good stuff on them, like really good modifiers across the board, but something like the bow attacks additional arrows, it's very, very highly valued. You can use a divine teardrop to try to go for a tier one, and you don't care about the weighting anymore. It's just you know unpredictably up or down. And just to show this working, we see we have tier six, seven, eight. Wow, that actually worked out really nicely. We have six, seven, eight right here. If I use a divine teardrop, it goes to five, six, seven. So all the tiers went up a tier. Now we have five, six, seven, and uh, we'll use another one just for kicks. And then we went to six, seven, six. So each one just rolls a 50, 50, flips a coin, can go up or down. So I've seen people go pretty ham with these and try to make an item really, really good because it unpredictably goes up or down you can try to get all your modifiers as high as possible just spamming divine teardrops. It's very commonly used for things like quivers and bows that are really hard to get these tier one modifiers. All right, and the king of the wacky town right here, this is the tainted mythic orb. How much are people valuing this right now? Eight chaos per. So the tainted mythic orb unpredictably upgrades a corrupted item to unique rarity or destroys it, period. And it doesn't say it has to be in a rare item or anything like that. So what this says is make this into a unique item, you know, make this into a mage blood, make this into a headhunter, whatever, or just poof the item. So what you can do is, you know, buy a bunch of heavy belts, corrupt them, and then use tainted mythic orbs on it and try to get the item that you're going for. However, this is still weighted with the weighting of the drops for those unique items. So, you know, this isn't really worth doing for headhunters and mage bloods, but for an item that has maybe like a tier two unique rarity, Maybe you're an SSF trying to use chance orbs and you can't get that item that you're going for. Tainted mythic orbs can just give you an additional chance to get that unique that you're going for. So let's see if we get a mage blood. <laughs> no, we did not. Uh, so we got a Meganords right here. And then with a superior crusader plate, let's see what we get. And it's gone. <laughs> you don't even get a poof animation. It just disappears. We got both of the outcomes from a tainted mythic orb. That's what it does. It's not valued very much, but if you want to gamble, you want to try to make a good unique, or if you're an SSF, you're going for something that's kind of difficult to get. It's a okay item to, to use. All right, that is all of the Tainted Scourge currency. It is very, very powerful. I think the, the Tainted currency in combination with the Eldritch stuff, what we've gone over already, these were really huge quality of life improvements for allowing us to craft our items in, you know, more, I, I hate to use the word deterministic, but having more control over item as we're crafting it to more safely interact with only parts of the item. Things like volling the item or annulling the item are no longer, you know, risking fully bricking it as much as it used to. All right, next up is the instilling and enkindling orbs right here. So these were added in 315, I believe, in Expedition League. These allow us to add enchants onto our flasks. And the two different ways that they do that is an instilling orb uh, adds an enchantment that causes it to be used when conditions are met. So that is when you block, when you become stunned, when the flask itself becomes full, when a flask next to the flask gets used. These are the default ones that most people use. The ones that I use the most are used when flask is full, right here, used when charges reach full. This one is just really great. You no longer have to press your buttons on your keyboard. You don't have to press, you know, pretend that you're not using a flask macro. You don't have to do any of that. 
you just use your craft right here for use when charges reach full. It'll go off automatically after you kill the first couple of monsters when you go into a map. So you don't have to worry about, you know, pressing the button ever. For example, I can go into Blood Aqueducts. My Dying Sun right here is enchanted with use when charges reach full. And you'll notice that when I kill my first set of monsters, it'll automatically go off. And then when I'm just running through the map real quickly, as long as I get enough charges, you'll see that it'll get full and then automatically use again. So that is by far my favorite enchant on the crafts. Most of the other ones for the instilling orb, I don't find as valuable. The other thing about crafting on the flasks is you can just put it in the crafting bench. This is really the right way that you should craft. I really recommend doing this instead of trying to spam it because there's a lot of them. It can be really annoying to spam, you know, 15, 20, 30 and not get the one that you're going for. Now, this is only for instilling crafts. Unfortunately, this does not apply for enkindled crafts. And let me get a dummy flask right here to show the enkindled flasks. You can see right here, this is my build with the mage blood. The go-to with the mage blood is increased effect. This goes up to 70%. Because the mage blood is always active, we want to go for that. We want to go for increased effect on the prefix and then 70% increased effect on the enchant. This is the enkindled thing. So enkindled crafts are actually kind of the opposite of instilling crafts. So enkindled flask actually says gain no charges during the effect. However, you can make it take reduced charges or be stronger. So if we look at these, there's actually not that many. Reduced charges per use, uh, increased charge recovery. Now this is kind of interesting. You'll get more charges after the flask is down. So you don't get 100% flask uptime, but you can get your charges back very quickly after the flask has run out. Reduce charges per use, increased duration. And then the last one is increased effect. And in fact, we hit perfect roll right there, 70%. And those are all of the rolls right there. The other crafts that you do on flasks, you can see right here, these come from unveiling specifically the Cinder Swallow unique flask. I think I have one right here. So the Cinder Swallow, this comes with a veiled modifier. You can see right here, the one that I unveiled is the increased critical strike chance during the effect. You can only get these unlocked by unveiling Cinder Swallows. People will actually pay a good amount for veiled Cinder Swallows because they want to unveil it themselves to unlock that craft. And then you can craft these suffixes on your own flasks. Some of these are very powerful. Life regen, stun avoidance, mana cost, rarity, reflected damage, and damage taken from hits is leech. So these are very powerful crafts. So that is all of the flask crafting that we need to know. All right, next up are the special heist currencies. These are the prime and secondary regrading lenses and tailoring and tempering orbs. I only have one of these. The other ones do the same thing, but slightly different. I'll tell you what those are in a second. So in Heist League, they added something called alternate qualities to gems. And you can get those special qualities by running uh, unusual gem blueprints. However, you can also try to influence this yourself. And that is through the regrading lenses. There are prime regrading lenses, which work for skill gems. And then the other one is called a secondary regrading lens, which works for support gems. That's the only difference between them. And what they do is they change the type of quality that is on the gem. So by default, cremation right here, it increases fire damage for its quality. However, there's other types of qualities on the item. And if I press Alt-W, this is with uh, Awakened PoE Trade, I can press Alt-W, it'll automatically open it up in the, uh, in the wiki. We can see that it actually has four different qualities, Anomalous, Divergent, and Phantasmal. And by using a prime regrading lens on it, it will change it from superior to one of these three and they have weightings. We know that Phantasmal Cremation is the most valuable right now, and that's what we would like to get. And so what we can see is we can scroll down and we can actually look at the weighting of the different modifiers. And we'll see very specifically that Phantasmal is more expensive. So since we're superior, this weight you know, doesn't come into the equation. If I use a primer grading lens, it has a 100 out of 160 chance, a very, very high chance of hitting anomalous. It has a 50 out of 160 chance of hitting divergent, one in 16 to hit phantasmal. So what you would actually like to do is you wanna check the prices and you wanna see if anomalous is cheaper, which it probably is, right? So we can just go to the trade website. You know, we can look right here. We can search for anomalous cremation. We can see that's only five, maybe 10 chaos. However, a primer grading lens is not cheap, almost a divine right now. So to give ourselves the best chance of doing this, we would actually buy probably multiple anomalous cremations. And we can look at the weighting here and we can see that if we already have anomalous, we actually have a 10 out of 110. We actually have a one in 11 chance instead of a one out of 16 chance to hit phantasmal off of anomalous. And that's what it does. So if I use the primer grading lens, there is a very, very high chance, a 10 out of 16 chance that I'm going to get uh, anomalous right here. So let's take a look. As we just saw, that's a good demonstration. We actually need some quality on the item. It needs to be at least 1% quality to do it. It does not work on vault gems, of course. And let's see what we got. We hit Divergent. 
So divergent is right here. This is actually the worst case situation. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, because divergent is the same exact weighting as superior, we still have a one out of 16 chance to get phantasmal off of the next one. The best chance is to do it off of anomalous because then that takes out most of the weight. So we'll go again. We'll try to get, oh my God. Okay. <laughs> Don't expect this in, in your own situation. Or you get really lucky and uh, off of Divergent, we went directly to Phantasmal. We hit the one out of 16 and Phantasmal Cremation, uh, if we check the price right now, this isn't really meta right now at time of recording, but it should be worth a lot more. Yeah, so if we look for non-corrupted Phantasmal Cremations, it's worth 130 chaos, 130, maybe up to a Divine. This is the more valuable one. We got really, really lucky with that. And yeah, that's the way that it goes. Prime and secondary grading lenses, that's what they do. Next up are the tailoring and tempering orbs. And they both do basically the same thing. They add or replace an enchantment on an item and it may reforge the sockets. So what tailoring orbs do is they have very specific special modifiers that can make your items you know, very powerful. So you can hit all sockets linked. You can get has two white sockets. And the big ones that people go for is 8% increased explicit life modifier. So if you have 100 flat life on your item, it'll go up to 108. And these are very, very powerful. There are some downsides that you can hit as you're rolling over this. I don't recommend six linking your item before you do this. You can hit things like has no green sockets. You can hit things like minus three to maximum sockets. So you go from six to three. So you have to be very careful about this. Strongly recommend doing this before you roll your sockets. Um, so if we put this on this item, there we go. 8% increased explicit mana modifier magnitudes. And if we take a look, if I craft some mana right here, you can see that I crafted 25, but it goes up to 27 because of the enchant. And then a tempering orb is basically the same thing, except it goes on weapons. And you can go to the wiki right here for tempering orb and look at the different enchants that you go for. So if you want to go for, you know, stronger physical modifiers, anything like that, that's what a tempering orb does. For example, I have a tempering orb craft on my tornado shot bow right here. It actually has a downside, which is reduced explicit critical modifiers, but 10% increased explicit fizz. So this is how you get the real big fizz bows. This is how you get the, the big boy stuff. So that's it for the heist crafting currencies. Next up, really tiny one, they added a tainted blessing right here. This is if you run lab and you want to change the enchant on a corrupted item. Let's say you have a really good double corrupt. You double corrupted a lot of different helmets. You hit that, you know, plus two socket of gem with a 90%. You really, really like that base and you want to add an enchant to it a little bit later. You can use that with a tainted blessing and then you can go to the lab and then you bypass the downside of not being able to enchant a corrupted item. Morning editor subtractum here. Uh, one quick thing that I did miss in the initial recording is the new stuff that they did with blighted enchanting. You can anoint specific items in the game. By default, it's only your amulet and your rings. Those specific blight uniques you can also anoint, which are the unique body armor, gloves, and boots. Previously, there was no way that you could anoint tainted or mirrored items, and they added special oils that let you do that. A tainted oil right here and a reflective oil. So by default, I can put in my onyx amulet right here. I can anoint, let's see, where's beef? There's beef. We can anoint beef right here. Boom, we're perfectly happy, that's great. But then maybe I double corrupted my amulet and I wanted to hit something really good. Now it's a corrupted item. I can go to my blight tab right here, use a tainted oil, and I can anoint something different. I can anoint alacrity here. It'll consume that tainted oil and then I can change the anoint. Very similar, you can do it on mirrored items. By default, you can't change anything on a mirrored item, but there is the reflective oil, which allows you to put an anoint on it. And we can just do that and we can add our anoints onto our mirrored items. And then last up is the oil extractor, which destroys an anointed item to recover one of the oils that was used to apply that anointment. So what you can do is search on the trade market. Uh, if you don't know, the most expensive anoint in the game is Whispers of Doom, which are three golden oils. You can just buy the cheapest amulets that you can find off the market that have Whispers of Doom, and it will pick one of the random oils from that item when it destroys it, and it gives it to you. And if the amulet has Whispers of Doom, you're guaranteed to get a golden oil from that no matter what. Little stretching the definition of crafting right here, but this is, you know, all of the currencies that you can use to manipulate an item. So if I use this right here, since it has Alacrity, Alacrity is three clear oils. We are guaranteed to get a clear oil from this item. So we click it, and you get the oil just from clicking on it. All right, back to the original recording. All right, next up is something very, very important to all modern crafting in Path of Exile, and that is fractured items. So what fractured items are is you'll see right here, you see that this modifier, tier one max life, is it's a golden color. That means it is fractured. You'll actually notice that the item has this 
kind of fractured glowy look to it. And what that means is the item cannot have influence. It cannot be synthesized. And we'll talk about synth items in a little bit. Can't be conquer influence. It can have Eldritch influence, but cannot have conquer influence. So that's another benefit to the new Eldritch influence. And the two main ways that you find fractured items is they can just drop. They can drop from rare monsters. That is a modifier that they have is just drop fractured items. It can come from all sorts of stuff in the game right now. It can drop from Blight. It can drop from Legion. But also you can make your own fractured items. And there is one way to do that. And that is with the fracturing orb. So a fracturing orb only comes from Harbinger. It is the rarest currency that drops from Harbinger. And it is very valuable and expensive. Fracturing orb right here. It costs nine divines at time of recording. Just, you know, take all the prices that I say also in the video with a grain of salt. This is just giving you a relative price, how it's valued right now. Fracturing orbs are pretty valuable because what it does is it takes an item and you can fracture one of the mods on it. The item has to have at least four modifiers and then it picks a random one from that. So to give yourself the best chance, you would have as many good modifiers that you can go for. If you have one good modifier, you have a 25% chance. If you have two good modifiers that you would like to hit, you get a 50% chance, etc. And what a fractured mod does is it can't go away no matter what. There's no way to remove that fractured mod which means that you can craft on top of it with already having one mod taken care of. You don't have to worry about it whatsoever. So tier one fractured life, that's great. I can scour this and it's still there. Now, because there's always one mod, it doesn't go to white. You can't scour it all the way, which means you can't use an alchemy to make it go back to rare. You have to use a regal orb to make it go back to rare. So that is kind of a downside of a fractured item. No matter what, we can't lose that modifier. So what that means is I can craft on this item life is already taken care of. This allows me to focus on other mods without having to worry about, you know, just hitting that one additional mod. So for example, if I want to go for something like crit chance right here, I can use an essence of loathing going for crit chance. I already have, to, no matter what I do, I have tier one life. I'm already, it's already taken care of. And so I can just spam tier life. There we go. <laughs> All right. I can just spam crit chance until I get an additional mod that I like. And we already have five mods right here. I can just craft the final mod like this, you know, elemental damage with attacks. And just like that, crit chance, I have plus one arrow and I got some damage on the prefixes. And already we have max life taken care of. This allows us to craft an item much, much more quickly. And the additional benefit of being able to use influence to only deal with prefix or suffix at a time, right? If you start thinking about that interaction, now we have even more power. For example, if we have a fractured suffix, we can use an essence right here to spam that essence on that suffix until we get the last suffix that we care about. And then we can just use the Eldritch influence on the prefixes by itself without interacting with the suffixes. Hopefully getting those juices flowing in your head, trying to understand the power of interacting with, you know, the interaction between essences, conquer influence, fractured mods, stuff like that. By already having one locked in mod, you can just essence spam, giving yourself another guaranteed mod. Remember, essences will just give you one modifier no matter what. This gives me that mod. So I can spam the essences until I get a third mod. And then I already have three good mods on the item. I can craft the last one. We can get a four or five mod solid item without too much effort by starting from a fractured base using essences or you know using fossils. They won't re-roll that fractured mod. And that's the beauty of it. And then a fracturing orb, right? As I said, it will fracture a random modifier. So the item, you know, can't be a conqueror item. It can't be an already fractured item. You can only have one fractured mod. Sorry, Recombinator fan. You can only have one fractured mod on the, on an item at time of recording. <laughs> there were ways to get around that in the past, but at time of recording, you can only have one fractured mod at a time. And so generally what you're going to do is you're going to take an item that has some stuff that you care about. So let's just hit this with a little like dexterity or something. You know, dexterity isn't going to roll on an armor base. So what I want to do is roll this until I have really high rolled dexterity and ideally another good mod that I care about to give myself the best chance to get what I want. But I'm going to do this until I see 58 dex because I want to try to fracture that 58 dex. And so instead of using divine orbs to reroll the modifier, right, we get 58 dex right here. Perfect. So 58 dex perfectly rolled and we have four mods, which gives us a 25% chance. We need at least four mods to use a fracturing orb. I have a 25% chance of hitting the dexterity that we care about. This is a lucky video. Okay, <laughs> so we get that 58 dex. Now this is beautiful. Now this way we can then roll other things on our item, right? Now we have that dex locked in. Now we can guarantee roll chaos res, do something like that until we hit something really good. So I can do chaos res until I hit, you know, physical damage reduction. I get some armor. So without too much additional effort, we can craft something that's like, that's pretty cool. And we can just take these steps and start putting them together. And the fractured item base is really the foundation of 
most modern crafting in Path of Exile. This is easily my most expensive build I've ever played. It's worth at least five or six mirrors, which for example is about three to 4,000 divines at time of recording. You'll see that my items are started from fractured bases. All of my rare items that I can are all fractured bases because it's the easiest to craft on top of them. So there are restrictions about what can be done to fractured items. They can't be synthesized, they can't be split, which we'll be talking about when we talk about beast crafting later, and they cannot be made imprints of either, which is also a beast craft, which we'll be talking about later. They cannot have a shaper influence, but they can have eldritch influence. They also cannot be chanced into unique items with an orb of chance. So yeah, that's fractured items. They're very, very powerful. They are the foundation. If you're ever thinking of crafting an item that doesn't have to be influenced, doesn't have to be conquer influence, strongly recommend thinking about different fractured bases that you can craft on. And the cool thing about this is think of all of the mods that you want on your item. So for example, you know, fractured spell suppression is great here, but I could try to do something a little bit different and I could go for fractured movement speed or fractured chaos res. And I could try to find a cheaper base that then I can still craft on, especially using essences or fossils. Start getting those juices flowing, start thinking about how those things interact. Next up and in the same vein, in the same kind of category are synthesized items. And what synthesized items are is they have many of the same restrictions that uh, fractured items have where they can't be split or anything like that. So synthesized items are special items that have different implicits. These originally come from Synthesis League and Synthesis Maps, but actually the most common way that you're gonna get the best ones these days is from Harvest. This is how you make them yourself. You can get them from generic reward chests, you can get them from Ritual, or you can get them from Heist as well as Uber Venarius, that's Uber Cortex. You can get them from the Forgotten and the Feared. And the most likely way that you can get the best ones is doing the Harvest Craft right here, which costs 5,000 Vivid Juice, as well as one Sacred Crystallized Life Force, which is pretty expensive. At time of recording, this is about two divines to create a synthesized item. Synthesized items can have between one and three implicits. It is random how many that you get when you do this craft. Three is obviously more powerful. And implicits can vary all the way from you know, here's a little bit of damage to something like spell damage per intelligence for like really good stacking items. There's additional arrow, there's additional frenzy charge, there's some very, very powerful ones. And synthesized items are in the same category as fractured items where they're kind of mutually exclusive with influence and you know also fractured items as well. So you can't have a fractured and synthesized item. They are mutually exclusive. The most expensive, most powerful items in the game are synthesized because you can stack really, really powerful stuff to make the biggest items in the game. You can use Eldritch Currency on a synthesized item and overwrite the implicits. Strongly recommend don't doing that. Um, that's a thing that the game just lets you do, but it will overwrite it. And that's really all you need to know about synthesized items. They're very powerful, but because you can't fracture them, you have to craft kind of the old fashioned way. And also because you don't want to use Eldritch stuff on them either then you can't really use the new Eldritch Currency to craft up a synthesized item. You're stuck doing very basic crafting. You're stuck doing very basic crafting because you're not allowed to use the uh, the more advanced modern stuff, which makes sense because of the power that you can get from those implicits to make the strongest items in the game. But yeah, let us uh, let me buy some yellow juice right here and we'll make a synthesized item ourselves, and maybe we can get something really good. We're not going to. All right, I went and grabbed a, a magistrate crown right here. Let's synthesize it and see what we get. I don't know the exact odds. It's not written in the wiki, but there's a chance between getting one, two, and three modifiers. It is way more likely to get one than three. So that's probably what we're going to get right here. And there we go. We got one, but we did get a really nice synthesized modifier. So we got plus one to level of socketed ore gems right here. And the cool thing is now we have a pretty cool item that then we can stack our additional craft, right? Level of socketed gems. And that way, in our helmet right here, now we can get plus two to level of our aura gems because you know most aura gems are also AoE gems. That just shows the power of synthesized base items. Imagine if that was a better roll, if that was plus two, and then I had the veiled prefix of plus two. You start to see the power of these items and the power that can kind of get unlocked. And the really interesting thing about synthesized items to me, they're so unique and so niche that you can be kind of creative in how you're putting your build together and starting to search around on the trade website for different synth combinations that work for your build that you know maybe people aren't valuing. And you can really find these diamonds in the rough that you can craft up for your build that are just really, really cool. That is synth items right there. They're very powerful, they're really cool. Strongly recommend you know playing around with them and seeing what you can get.
Next up is Harvest. Luckily, I didn't go over Harvest that much in the previous video because it got dramatically reworked since the last video. I'm not gonna go into extreme detail about Harvest here, but I'm gonna go over the vast majority of the crafts that are in here. There's some like kind of niche ones that don't really, that are for like gambling and stuff like that. We're not gonna go into stuff like that, but we are gonna go into the crafts that people use for crafting. So the most common ones right here are Reforge, Fire, Cold, Lightning, Fizz, Life, Defense, Chaos Attack, Caster, Speed, Crit. Speed and Crit are the most expensive at 150. Chaos is 100. There's a few 75s, and then the very common ones are only 50. So what Harvest does these days is when you do a Harvest Encounter in a map, instead of doing the Harvest in the map itself, it will drop this currency, the Crystallized Life Force, three different colors, that then enable you to do the crafts in your hideout as long as you have the juice. I call it juice the juice to run your harvest crafts. So what you can do is, you know, spec into harvest, do whatever. We're not gonna go over strategies for doing harvest here, but when you have the juice and you can buy it on the trade market, as long as you have the juice to do it, you can do these crafts in the hoarder crafting station right here. So the simplest thing, for example, is I wanna get chaos res. And I know that there is only one chaos modifier that I can get on a body armor. We can verify that by looking right here. This And what this does, right, it says including. It guarantees that it gets only one. It doesn't influence additional modifiers. It just guarantees that you're going to get one of that type. And so if we go to body armor strength right here and we can click on chaos, we can see that the only chaos modifier that we can get on a body armor is chaos res. This body armor, unfortunately, is lower item level. It is 71. So if we click on the chaos res right here, we can see that we can get up to item level 65. We can see that we can get up to tier two chaos res and we can guarantee when we click that reforge chaos that we will get a chaos res. So I can just go right here. I can type chaos in the search right here and we'll go over augs a little bit later. By reforge a rare with random modifiers, it's just a chaos orb. It does the exact same thing as a chaos orb, but it guarantees that one of those mods has that tag of chaos. I do that reroll, it guarantees, right? It's a full chaos orb but it guarantees I get one chaos res. And I can do it again. And we get tier four. We'll go until we hit tier two. There we go. Tier two chaos res. We got tier five lightning res. So then I can just craft life on top of it, right? Just showing examples of finishing the item. Crafted life. We got a couple of reses. We got our fracture dexterity. We can go from there. So that's the power of these like very simple default crafts. Below that is the reforge more likely and reforge less likely. <laughs> what this does is uh, the, it finds the tags that are on these items and it adds weight to those tags. And it actually doesn't add that much. It used to add like hundreds, but now it just adds a little bit. So people don't really use these anymore. But for example, if I really want to get chaos res and I'm all out of yellow juice and, you know, I, I want it to be more likely to get chaos res and armor on the prefix, I can throw it into this one and hopefully I hit chaos res again. Nope, but I did get lightning res and I got armor modifier. It's more likely that I'm going to get the same modifier types it looks at those tags, gives them a little bit more weight, and it does that. It's a fairly expensive craft at 200 juice. You can see I lost the chaos. It's very risky. It's not used very often these days. Same thing, less likely. It'll decrease the weight of the tags that are already on the item. If you just want to like full YOLO, give me the random of everything. I don't want what I see. Give me something random. People don't really use this one at all, I don't think. That's just like, you know, throw caution to the wind. Give me whatever you want to give. All right, and my most favorite craft that is in the Horda Crafting Station are these. Change a modifier that grants cold res into a similar tier modifier that grants fire res. And I'll talk about the example that is very powerful here. What this does is, for example, oh, I got way too much cold res and I'm a little bit low on lightning res. How do I fix that? What I could do is look on my gear right here and say, oh, actually I got too much fire res as well. So I can actually just change fire into cold and boom, the fire turns into cold and we're good to go. Now, the restrictions here are you can't have, you know, two cold reses. You can't do lightning to cold right here because it says already has no valid mods, right? And it also keeps it within the tier. So we see that we have tier seven cold res. If I go cold to fire, we'll see that we have tier seven fire res as well. So it stays within the tier. So we can't fix that in any way. So you're stuck with what you got. But the very cool thing is if you want to roll it up, like instead of using a divine orb, you can actually go back and forth. So I can go fire to cold. I can go fire to cold and then back to cold to fire until I get a higher roll of my fire res. And you can do this to go back and forth until you get, you know, you can get a, a little bit more res on your gear as well. This is my favorite, just helps you fix up your res on your gear. Very, very powerful. You can also do it on jewels. It's not just restricted to your armor. Very, very powerful. And then the other very special use of it is something like this. So this is the temple mod 
that has res as well as damage with hits against chilled enemies. Now, there's additional mods that are very similar that are also temple mods that work in the same category. So this temple mod has equivalent modifiers like critical strike chance against shocked enemies hybrid with the lightning res. And so what you can do is find gloves that have the hybrid shock or the ignited modifiers and then put them into this and it'll actually switch the whole hybrid mod over to damage with hits against chilled enemies, which is really, really nice. Early league especially, you can search for these, switch the res and you also get the, uh, the other damage modifier with it. So that's a nice little thing that you can do. Next up is the kind of leveled up version of the reforges, which are the add removes. So this used to be called augment because it used to just add a mod no matter what. But now it's add remove. And as you can see, these are very, very expensive. They cost 17,500 juice as well as one sacred crystallized life force. Time of recording, this is about six or seven divines to do. This is very expensive. However, it's even more for speed and crit. This is a way that you can deterministically in some instances add something like plus one level of all fire gems on an amulet. Because what it does is if there's no other fire mods to add, it will guarantee, it just, it just says add a modifier that has that tag. And if there's only one with that tag, you can guarantee get that mod that you're looking for. However, you'll notice that it also says remove. So if you're trying to go for, you know, perfect modifiers, you'll usually go for a crafted mod and you want it to remove that crafted mod and it's a little bit of a gamble like most crafting in this game. I'll try to find, I guess I'll show it in the video. It's, it is a very expensive one. Uh, I'll try to find a good example for you guys. As I mentioned, is we want to guarantee getting plus level of all fire skill gems. If I click in Craft of Exile right here, if I click the fire tag, we'll see that there are two fire suffixes, increased fire damage and increased fire res, and two fire prefixes, all fire skill gems and fire damage to attacks. And we can see by mousing over that we can craft fire damage to attacks. So what this means is if we have full suffixes and we have crafted fire damage to attacks, we can guarantee that no matter what, aug fire, add remove fire, will add level of all fire skill gems. And we'll demonstrate that really quickly. So what I'm gonna do is go for full suffixes, and we're just gonna chaos spam right here, full suffixes, and we're gonna craft fire damage to attacks right here. And yeah, this is all it's gonna take. So the ideal that you would go for is, you know, other good modifiers that you care about, make sure that the item is almost done before you do this but this is the general idea. And then we'll add a fire modifier. All right, even better actually, not only can I not afford fire right now, but we already have cold damage to attacks right here. And this is really cool because cold is the same thing to fire. Because we have cold damage to attacks, let's say for example, we wanna perhaps protect that cold damage with attacks or make it more likely that we keep it. So I'm gonna craft like a dead mod here and we're gonna cross our fingers and hope that it removes the dead mod. This is very unlikely, but we want it to remove the crafted mod and then we're gonna aug the cold. Now we could also craft stuff because this can't be changed, make it a 50-50, but we're gonna go over metamods a little bit later. Uh, we're gonna try to do this without metamods. So we're gonna do add a cold modifier and see what it removes. And this is gonna guarantee no matter what, it's gonna add plus one all cold gems. Boom. Unfortunately, it did not remove the crafted mod. It did remove the cold damage to attacks but it kept all the suffixes and now we have level of all cold skill gems. And something along those lines is kind of the most common case that we've seen for, you know, you wanna get that lowest weight mod, you wanna block all of the other mods of that tag, then you can actually deterministically add the one modifier that you're going for. So that's the power of the augment craft. Quickly going over, we can enchant body armors, we can enchant weapons. What these enchants do, the harvest enchants, they will actually remove what a default quality does. So for example, quality on a body armor increases the natural defensive characteristics. When you enchant this, it'll no longer do that. Also, it'll replace the enchant that you might've had from a heist enchant. So those are mutually exclusive. So if I want flat mana per quality, so if I had 30% quality, I'll get 15 mana from this. It'll actually overwrite the, uh, yeah, it'll actually even give me a warning. The uh, tailoring orb will get overwritten and then we get this. Now you'll notice that the armor went down. I no longer get armor from the quality but now I get flat mana. In so that's what these enchants do. And it does the same thing for weapons. Weapons will no longer increase the physical damage, but you can get area of effect, attack speed, crit chance, stuff like that. Most casters don't care about physical damage on a weapon. So these are very common on caster weapons, especially area of effect and elemental damage. Do note that the attack speed and critical strike chance are local to the weapon. These aren't going to apply to caster weapons, but these are really good for particularly elemental weapons that don't care about the inherent physical damage modifiers. You can craft a random white socket on an item. As you can see, this is expensive as well. And then last up is reef 
reforging an influenced item with a guaranteed influence modifier. This is a way that you can target trying to go for very difficult to get influence modifiers. Same as before, you can meta mod and block certain modifiers if you can craft uh, blocks and anything like that. This is the exact same thing as Reforge Fire, Reforge Cold, but instead of being linked to the tags that you have in the modifiers here, it will just guarantee give you one of the influence mod, like the item has to have the influence. But if you have a hunter influenced item and you do Reforge Influence, it guarantees gives you one of these instead of rolling from the entire pool. And so that's a good way that you can limit the pool and make it more likely to hit some of those difficult modifiers. But as you can see, it is a very expensive craft. It is um, at time of recording, that's roughly 1.5 divine. And that is it for harvest crafting. Again, there's advanced stuff that you can do with meta mods that we're gonna get into very shortly. That might even be next up. All right, good, meta mods are next. We don't have to stall that any, any further. And yeah, thanks for watching this far. If you guys have been watching the entire video, by the way, really appreciate that. And I uh, hope you guys are learning something and enjoying this. Go for a walk and drink some water if you need to take a break. I know I do. All right, and then the doozy. The meta mods and where you find them, and this is at time of recording, these locations will change. Do go to this right here, poewiki.net, crafting bench, crafting modifiers. This will tell you where to get. This can change on a whim, so this is just time of recording. You can go right here, and these are the meta mod crafts. What they are is cannot roll attack modifiers, suffixes can't be changed, prefixes can't be changed, can have up to three crafted modifiers, and cannot roll caster modifiers. And the price of these and what determines the entire economy of the game. For example, I think at the last video, exalts were the expensive currency and this league divines are the expensive currency. And the only thing that GGG changed was what the meta mod craft was. Meta mods and the crafting with meta mods is fundamental to making the biggest items in the game. These are the most powerful crafts that we get that allow us to directly influence what currency is going to do on an item. And that is why they cost the most expensive currency in the game. These used to cost exalted orbs and that's why exalts were worth so much. It wasn't because they were so rare or anything like that. The price of exalts at time of recording, the only thing that GGG changed, right? Exalts are currently 10 chaos per, whereas divines are 230. And the only thing that they changed is the cost of the meta mods from exalts to divines. So why are they so powerful? Even talking about this, like for example, so just starting off, the best thing that you're gonna wanna do is this wiki page. I'm gonna go through as much as I can. I'm not gonna go into extreme detail. You can make an entire video on just meta mods. I'm gonna show you guys a lot of the uses of it, why it's so powerful, things that you can do with it, but getting into all the nuance, it really takes hours and hours of experience of just knowing like, oh, I could have done this, I could have done that. This is the foundation of all advanced crafting in Path of Exile. So I'm gonna cover as much as I can right here. But again, a lot of this comes with experience, crafting specific items, getting over that hump of spending multiple divines just to do a single thing on an item. And then once you get over that, you start doing that, things will start to click and you'll start to understand the interplay between the meta mods and all of the other things that you can do. <laughs> all right, demonstrating this is gonna be kind of expensive as well. <laughs> But we're just gonna get right to it. So really one of the most common ones that people do, and I actually have it on my go-to weapon that I'm playing right now on my uh, my Lightning Strike Guardian, my new favorite build I've ever played. We call it the multi-mod. It used to be called multi-mod, but now it's just can have up to three crafted modifiers right here. It says of crafting, can have up to three crafted modifiers. It itself is a crafted modifier, but what it allows you to do is just craft two more mods on the item. So that means, for example, you know, looking at this current item, I had a fractured base, I used essences until I got one additional mod, and then I just multi-modded, I crafted can have three, and I crafted the last two mods. This does mean that I'm stuck with a five mod item. If I wanna go full YOLO, I can use an annul and try to annul off the can have three. The crafted mods don't go away if that modifier goes away, but I could YOLO annul that six can have three and try to exalt a random modifier on it if I wanted to. This is a very common way that people do mid tier weapons is you can essence, you can harvest craft, fossil craft until you get two or three good mods. And then you can just multi-mod two guaranteed useful mods on the item for a four or five mod item. And then you're good to go off of that. This will never lead to the perfect item in the game because it's crafted mods, but it's a great tool. It's a great way that you can shore up a lot of, you know, a lot of mid-tier crafts and bring them to the next level. I think this is the most common use of can have three crafted modifiers. I'll show you the actual mechanics of what it looks like and what it feels like. Also, the thing to note is that you get any random rolls within it. So normally when you're crafting something, you can just recraft it until you get a good roll on it. But in this situation, 
we can't do that. If we try to remove the mods, it'll remove all of the mods. So normally, right, if I wanna go for a good roll of mana, I can just click on this and I can just keep clicking until the mana is good. I can just keep clicking that. It just costs a scour orb. However, if I craft, can have up to three crafted, right? That is my one crafted modifier. The next two times that I craft a mod on it, it will add additional crafts. It won't remove, it'll add two more. Let's see what we wanna add onto this beautiful, beautiful crafting base. We'll add mana, it's our favorite. We actually hit a mid roll of the mana, but I can't recraft it. It actually won't let me recraft it. I actually have to use a divine orb to try to get that roll better. We want armor, we like armor on our build, right? And then we hit mid tier armor. You'll notice that I can't craft additional mods. There's no remove, there's no add, anything like that. The only thing that I can do, right? Can have, I can't do anything. The only thing that I can do is remove crafted mods. If I remove crafted mods, say goodbye to two divines, boom, they're all gone. All of the crafted mods, everything, including the meta mod gets removed. So in that situation, if you really care about the roles for what you're crafting, you will have to go into divines and all that a little bit later. So that is can have three crafted mods is a very powerful, wonderful meta mod that um, you know, we'll get into very shortly what it can interact with. Now, next up, our prefix and suffixes cannot be changed. They do exactly what they say. There's nothing magical about it, but there are restrictions and stuff that happens, like I said. As earlier, like I said, like Veiled Chaos Orb, sometimes things won't work because it can't generate the mod, right? If you do prefixes can't be changed and you already have a prefix that's a Veiled Mod, you can't use a Veiled Suffix, you know, you can't use a Veiled Chaos Orb. There's a lot of little things that can happen, a lot of gotchas that you can run into. But what prefixes can't be changed does is Prefixes can't be changed. And the thing is, this craft, you know, which makes sense, it is a suffix. And then suffixes can't be changed is a prefix. Full prefixes, I'm happy with them, I love them. Then I can do prefixes can't be changed. And anything that I do, my next craft, will only interact with suffixes. I cannot change the prefixes, no matter what. You can't even divine them. If I really wanted a perfect divine, oh, we actually got 69 life on tier already. Let's exalt a random mod on there. Ooh, that armor? Right? Oh, that armor, I don't love it. Let's exalt a suffix on as well, just to demonstrate. Here we go. So we can craft prefixes can't be changed. And if I use a divine orb, <laughs> this video is very expensive. If I use a divine orb, we'll notice that the prefixes just won't change. So if I only want to divine my suffixes, if this is how you go for perfect, perfect items. If I only want to divine my suffixes, I can do this. And look, the, only the lightning res will change. There you go, I'll do it twice, just to demonstrate. Prefixes can't be changed no matter what. What this means is I can do things like the previously mentioned Ashling Craft. Like I said, the Ashling Craft, the tier four Ashling will remove a mod and replace it with the Veiled modifier. The other thing to note about prefix and suffix can't be changed is that's only the existing modifiers. If there are empty modifiers, if there's an empty prefix, we can actually still fill that. So I can still exalt and try to get a prefix on here. An exalt right here will guarantee give me a prefix and I can still add it because prefixes can't be changed, only affects existing modifiers. So I can add a prefix on here. The Veiled Chaos Orb still could have given me a Veiled prefix, and we wanna guarantee get a Veiled suffix. So a Chaos Orb or a Veiled Chaos Orb, these now do the same thing that the Eldritch Chaos Orb does, but without the Eldritch influence. If you remember, the Searing Exarch or Eater of Worlds Dominance allowed the Eldritch Chaos Orb only to affect one of those for one use, a Chaos Orb or a Veiled Chaos Orb will re-roll the suffixes only and pre those prefixes will be protected still. However, do note that prefixes can't be changed is a suffix. So it will go away. By using a Chaos Orb or a Veiled Chaos Orb, I will lose that craft. The prefixes will be protected once, but that craft will go away and every single time I have to use a Veiled Chaos Orb, I have to recraft for two divines. Prefixes cannot be changed. If we want this Veiled Suffix, boom and you can see it's a lot shorter, that means it's a suffix, then we guarantee we got that. We protected our prefixes, they did not change. And before our unveil, right, we can craft something to block. Let's, uh, let's craft like fire res, we wanna block fire res. And we'll unveil right here, get our veiled suffix. And yeah, we love lightning and chaos res, beautiful. That is one example of what you can do with prefix and suffixes can't be changed. That's kind of like your go-to case. This is the most common thing. Very, very common is to do it on boots. It is a near but not 100% chance to unveil movement speed on a pair of boots if you have a veil prefix. So generally the way that you would craft boots, you'd start with like fractured something on your boots. Let's just get full suffixes. All right, beautiful. 
this is the general way that you would craft a pair of boots is you would start with a like fractured spell suppression, use some essences until you get some res, whatever. And then you can craft suffixes, can't be changed. Protects our suffixes, right? We already crafted them. They're beautiful. We love that. 31 life regen, cold res, spell suppression. That is worth the money. We will lose that tier one life and the movement speed, but we really want that veiled movement speed. We really want onslaught. We want chill immunity, something like that. So with suffixes can't be changed. We do a veiled chaos orb. We protected our suffixes. Before the unveil, we'll craft mana to block because we don't want to get mana on the unveil. Excellent. And at a, a very close to 100% chance, we're going to get movement speed. And just like that, we got movement speed and onslaught and we got a pair of boots really quick. All right, and I just wanted to show this one to you guys because it is a doozy. This one blew my mind the first time that I saw it. And that is the fact that when something is protected, it is really protected. When you scour an item, it makes it go white and it totally removes all of the explicit modifiers. However, with prefix or suffix can't be changed, as long as that is there, it will absolutely just protect those prefix or suffixes. It'll remove the prefix or suffix can't be changed, but that is a way that you can cleanly just remove all of the prefix and suffixes. For example, if you wanted to multi-mod, you know, two suffixes and you had one extra suffix on your item, you were happy with your prefixes, something like that. So a quick little example here, pretend like I like these suffixes. I love these three perfect suffixes, but we have an extra prefix. We don't like that prefix and we want to put other stuff on there. So what I can do is go to suffixes can't be changed and be very careful about this. The scour orb will remove every single modifier that is not protected. But if we craft suffixes can't be changed, we can see that those are now protected, but the prefixes are not. So we click on the orb of scour, double check, always double check before you do this. It should be a little scary every time you do it, but there you go. We removed only the prefixes and the suffixes were protected. As someone who was crafting some mirror tier gear last league and I accidentally scoured my item a couple of times because we were crafting this item over the course of uh, monotonous hours, it's very easy to make that mistake. Be very, very careful. Make sure you click to the, uh, you know, the craft protect and double check before you use that scouring arm. All right, I just want to show that one to you guys because that one blew my mind when I first learned it. It was, uh, it was pretty wild. All right, back to the original video. And that is the power of prefix and suffix can't be changed. Uh, there are many, many more uses of it, but these are the most common one. Next up are the cannot roll modifiers. So these ones are arguably the most advanced ones. What these do is it guarantees that you can't hit a mod with either an exalt or an annul of that tag. So these are really, really powerful. It guarantees that, for example, I have attack on this item and I really, really, really want to keep that attack no matter what. That is my favorite modifier in the entire world and I don't want to lose it, but I really want to annul that mana. I hate that mana and I want to keep that attack. So what I can do is I can craft cannot roll attack modifiers and this actually guarantees that my annuls will not remove fire damage to attacks. So let's show that in action right here. Oh, well, it removed the craft. <laughs> that can happen as well. So this can get expensive. All right, remove, remove, remove. All right, and I'm all out of annuls. But as you just saw, it guarantees that we cannot hit an attack modifier on an annul, and it does the same thing on an exalt as well. So let's say I really don't want an attack modifier when I exalt on here. I got the perfect attack modifier. I don't want any more though. This is the only one I care about. By leaving this craft on the item and exalting, I guarantee, and you know, this it's hard to show this perfectly in action because there's a lot of modifiers that I can hit, but it guarantees that no matter what modifier that I exalt, it will not give me an another attack modifier. And the only difference is cannot roll caster is the exact same thing. They are both suffixes as well. Also, yeah, prefix can't be changed, cannot roll attack modifiers, cannot roll caster modifiers, and can have three are all suffixes. Suffixes can't be changed is the only prefix meta mod, and uh, that will matter when we get to beast crafting a little bit later. And then the interplay of all of these, I do recommend going through the wiki right here. Strongly recommend just looking up different videos of specific crafts. There's only so much that I can go into without spending hours and hours on this. This is the most complex advanced part about crafting in PoE, and they're all very niche specific examples that kind of build on top of each other. You can really start thinking about what if I do something like can have three crafted modifiers, cannot roll attack modifiers, prefixes can't be changed, and a null. And you can do things like that to very specifically target annulling specific mods or exalting specific mods. 
And the interplay of all of these meta mods is incredibly powerful and expensive. But this is how the most expensive items that are worth thousands of divines are made. This bow, for example, this was crafted by Belt in Last League. I don't know if they ended up making a bow that's better than this one, but at the time that I got this bow, this was the best bow in the entire game and it cost them tens of thousands of divines to craft. And the way that they did this is by doing meta mods over and over again, guaranteeing that they're only interacting with one mod, exulting until they get that perfect mod, and then they can do the meta mods to, you know, a null off one mod that they don't like, and doing that over and over and over again. And that's the power of these meta mods and the amount of money that you could put into it. And then the money that people get back out of it is by mirroring it and getting mirror fees, right? So you put 10,000 divines into crafting something, but then people will pay you 100, 200 divines to then mirror it and get a copy of it. So over the course of time, you can recoup your costs and become very profitable and have you know the best item in the entire game. So that's why people go for those really big mirror tier crafts, which is something that I got into last league and I made a couple myself. That is meta mods. Again, very, very complex. There's a lot into it, but that's the foundation of it. Again, recommend going to, you know, just slash wiki slash metamod on the wiki right here, reading through the different use cases that they have, you know, look up local hall videos, stuff like that from trusted crafters, see how they craft items, see how they interact with these metamods. But I just want to show you guys, you know, some direct examples of how it's done and, you know, get those creative juices flowing. All right. Thanks for sticking with me. We just got one thing left. We're almost done. And then you guys can go off into the wild and enjoy crafting beautiful items in the game. Beast crafting. What is it? Beast crafting, I went over it very, very quickly in the last video, but they added quite a few advanced beast crafts to the game since then. Starting off with beast crafting allows you to put an item into this blood altar right here. You'll click on something and a bunch of monsters will come out. Some of these crafts don't require items. You can just go in here, kill the items really quickly, kill the monsters really quickly rather, and you'll get whatever it tells you. And you can get some chromes, you can get whatever. It can transform items, it can create unique items. You know, maybe you can get really lucky. You do this belt and you get a mage blood or something like that. And uh, boom. Oh my God, I got a mage blood. Oh, cool. Great. <laughs> There's some fun little ones that you can do that, especially early league, are really good. What we care about right now, what we're going to talk about is what you can do for crafting, and particularly the advanced beast crafts. So I guess we'll start off with imprints. Imprinting is based on an actually old mechanic in the game. Very, very old. It actually predates me ever playing this game. It comes from the beast called the Krasic Chimeral. To do a beast craft, by the way, you have to have at least three rare creatures and the special unique creature. And if we look on, uh, if we look on the trade site right here, Crazy Chimerals. Also, the thing about beast crafting is the price varies greatly. So we can see right now this isn't standard. If we go into current league, 1.4 divines per. You can buy these very cheap early on, and then later on the price will go up and up as people have more money and they start crafting bigger items. So if you do want to get into crafting, I do recommend buying these things early if you're going to be using these. This is based on something really old in Path of Exile called an Eternal Orb. And actually, do I have any in my stash? I might. Yeah, not, I don't have an Eternal Orb, but I have an imprint. This is an item that when used on an item that you made an imprint of it, it goes back to its previous state. And I'll show you exactly what that is because saying what that is is really weird. First off, for imprints, this only works on blue items. So you can't do this on a rare item anything like that. It has no other restrictions besides it has to be a blue item and it can't be fractured. It can be a conqueror item. It can be an influenced item. It can even be a synthesized item. So we don't care about synth or anything like that. The only restriction is blue and not fractured items because with a fractured item, that would be very, very powerful, right? Because you could guarantee two modifiers, you know, very quickly. They don't allow that. But besides that, create an imprint right here. Kill the monsters really quickly. And we'll get this item on the ground called an imprint. And you'll see very specifically, it says imprinted, Cheetah's worm scale Boots of the Newt. And this is tied to that item itself. As long as the item is not split or corrupted, no matter what you do to this item, you can use your imprint to go back to its original state. So I can do anything to this item. This item has its own unique number. Let's say this number is one, two, three, four. The only way to change what the number of this item is, is by splitting it. And, you know, we can't use items on corrupted items. As long as we don't split, we can always, we can use uh, Awakener's Orbs. We can use, uh, we can synthesize the item and actually go back to the pre-synthesized state. The usual case that you would go for is you would roll, you know, the perfect modifiers that you want on a blue item. Two really hard to get mods, like a really hard to get prefix and suffix. And then you create the imprint and then you're going to go for a regal and try to get a good third mod or a modifier that you can safely annul and then you're left with your two good mods and then the item is rare 
because we can't craft on the item or anything like that when it's blue. So if I just wanna protect these two good mods, I really care about T2 movement speed and uh, tier eight life regen. These are my two favorite mods in the whole game. I wanna protect those, but I wanna get life on these boots and I can't craft it. So what I would do is regal and hope I get something that I like, right? Oh, armor and evasion, that kind of bricks it because I wanted movement speed, life and mana. I wanted life and mana on there. I really don't like the armor and evasion. So I tried to annul, I actually can't annul. So I really don't like that. I don't have any annuls left. I don't like that. So what I can do is I can use the imprint and go back to the blue version. The imprint gets consumed and we go back to the previous version of the item. We can actually make multiple imprints that we can save our time, do that. And then we can do our regal. Let's see, go here and regal it up. See if we get something that we like. Reduce, okay, reduce attribute requirements. That's not a prefix. We're okay on that. Let's try to exalt something good. Cold res, I don't mind. Okay, we hit life. Mm, ah, we didn't hit man, I don't like it. We can go back to the imprint and we still have another one. This is, think of it like source control where all the imprints point to a certain version and then you can branch out however you want and then always go back to that original version. Like I can add influence, anything like that. Let's exalt that. Okay, dexterity. What if I really want a redeemer mod? Ooh, increased effect of non-damage ailments. Don't love that. Look at this, we can use the imprint. It actually went all the way back. It, it did a full rewind. It removed the redeemer influence and it went back to this version. This is a way, if you have a Conquer Exalted Slam as part of your craft, anything like that, you can always use the imprint to go back to where you were. And you can do this in all sorts of things. You can do this with your meta mod. I'll show you a really powerful thing that you can do. Let's see, this is a suffix. So suffixes can't be changed, go like that. And then we can go back to the menagerie. Here's like the real use case. So now, we have an imprint with suffixes can't be changed, right? That's a two divine craft that then we can use an imprint to protect. So if we're regaling, we regal, we hit spell suppression, pretty good, suffixes can't be changed, veiled chaos orb, and let's see if we like the unveil. All right, we'll do the unveil here, see if we like that. I don't like that increased movement speed. I just don't like that. It's not my favorite. I really wanted chill immunity or I really wanted, you know, onslaught, something like that. I can use the imprint and go back to the version with that two divine meta mod. That way I can protect and keep the hard to get mod. And this is particularly powerful if you're using elevated conqueror mods. So if you, you know, put all of the effort into doing an orb of dominance and trying to get that elevated mod, then you can, you know, craft something like suffixes can't be changed with your elevated mod, protect that with an imprint and then try to finish your craft. Always go back to the imprint. The Krasic Chimeral. This is one of the most powerful beast crafts in the game. Always keep that on your list of things that you can do to build up your craft from scratch. All right, beautiful. My favorite one we're gonna get to right now, the Ferric Buddies. So these are my favorite ones. I forget about them all the time, but they're so powerful and they save you so much time and money. These guys are usually pretty cheap. They'll usually be like 10 to 20 chaos per, sometimes the price will go a little bit more. What they do is it adds a suffix, removes a random prefix and vice versa. The Ferric Lynx is to add a suffix and Ferric Wolf is to add a prefix. So in the previous example here, this is actually perfect for this bootcraft we were showing. In this example, I really, really, really don't want a prefix. I really want a suffix. So if I regal this and I get a prefix, which I did, all right, perfect. I got a prefix, I really don't want that. I wanna keep the prefixes safe. I can actually just do, add a suffix, remove a random prefix, clean off those prefixes, and it moved it down to a suffix. So now the prefixes are clean again. So that's a great way that you can always, right, whenever you regal something, you exalt something, if you have an open mod on the other side that you can scour later, annul later, you can always move one of those mods up or down. This is a great tool to, you know, sometimes protect a craft or, or, or salvage a craft that particularly if your regal went bad and to save money instead of using a random annul that could hit your suffix or your prefix. And this is, it's more of a targeted annul as long as you don't care about the, the added modifier. So I love these ferret guys and uh, you know, always keep those on your list. All right, and then conqueror slamming. This is not the most popular thing in the game. It's not used as much as it used to be. Instead of spending an exalt, we can use the add a mod to an item. Unfortunately, these are kind of not very good. I do believe that they respect the item level of the monster that you get them. So there's some nuance for what you can do for the item that you're, for the mod that you're exalting. But generally these are just regular exalts. These are not warlord exalts or anything like that. It's a regular exalt that happens to work 
against items that have that conquer influence. That makes sense. This doesn't guarantee that I, I get a redeemer mod. It's just a free exalt, basically. These used to have a lot more value when exalts were you know, expensive, but since exalts and divines changed, I would rather see this change to like do a divine reroll of a redeemer item. That would actually be worth more. And I think that would be a smart change that GGG could make. But yeah, we'll just do this and you'll see, I'll get a random mod. I'll get like life regen or something like that. And yeah, <laughs> lucky video guys, lucky video. Life regen is, is the highest weight, so. So we got life regen right there and that's it. So yeah, it just slammed a random mod on an item that happened to be a redeemer. They're not that good. All right, let's see. The other one that's really good, corrupted item to be 30% quality. The nice thing about this, this ties in really, really nicely with the Scourge Tainted Currency. So for example, what if I love this item, it's my really good league starter, and I want to get this to at least a five link. And it's just, it's not worth, like, I don't want to risk a Vol Orb because a Vol Orb could brick the item. I can safely, actually, before I do that, let's, let's do this. I can safely corrupt this, actually, with this craft. So, and the nice thing is you actually get 30% quality out of it as well. So we're going to do four sockets, and then we're going to do four link sockets. So we're going to craft that first. Then we're going to grab our Tainted Currency. Let's see, we got plenty. Good, good, good. Actually, six sockets would be better. This is pretty cheap. All right, we got four link, six sockets. This is one of the easiest ways you can get a six link early. If I really love this body armor, I crafted it up. It's beautiful. I love that uh, plus nine armor. It's a beautiful item. I can actually safely corrupt it. This makes the item corrupted. It's not like using a Vol Orb. It makes the item corrupted, sets the quality to 30, but does not risk bricking it whatsoever. So this is just a very safe corrupt that you can do. And now it's 30% quality. And now we can use our Tainted Fusings and we can get a six link like that. Just really easily make a six link early league just like that. That is what I recommend doing. That's a great use of that craft. Strongly recommend just keeping that in the back of your mind to safely corrupt an item if you want to use Tainted Currency on it. Next up is adding Aspects. So Aspects, they're like auras, but they're, they, they're not auras. They do not count as auras. An Aspect is something that gives you a buff or it does debuffs on the enemies in the case of Aspect of the Spider. I believe I have all of them in standard here. We have Aspect of the Cat, Avian, Spider, and Crab. I'm not going to go over what they all do. You can look it up on the wiki. But this adds the ability for you to use that Aspect on your character. So if I craft Aspect of the... Sure, let's do Avian. Spider is the most common. Spider makes enemies take more damage, and it slows them down. This is the most common one, but we'll do Avian. Why not? The other ones are kind of a special case. What it does is it adds a suffix to the item, so it takes up that slot gives you the ability to cast that aspect. And it is a reservation skill. So you can see right here, it, uh, I don't have enough mana. So if I turn off my auras, then I can cast it. And you'll see right here, I have Avian's Might. You and your minions have a chance to deal double damage. And then it actually goes between Avian's Flight. You get movement speed as well. Their aspects, they have a mana reservation. They get affected by your mana reservation efficiency. They're pretty niche in modern Path of Exile. You'll see Aspect of the Spider once in a while, but they're not used that much anymore. The power creep has kind of surpassed them, at least at time of recording. We'll show the Wild Bristle Matron first, and then we'll show the really advanced case for the, uh, it's actually the best way that people make the most expensive items in the game. And we'll show one quick example of that with the Vivid Vulture. It's a lot easier to buy them in bulk and standard, so rip 13 divines. So Wild Bristle Matron, this is one of the more advanced ones. What this says is add a crafted meta modifier to a non-unique item. If you remember, there's pretty much just one use case for this beast. At time of recording, in standard, it is 1.3 divines. In Ancestor League, it is also 1.3. It's very standardized. What it can do, early league, it also early league, they're very cheap, so recommend buying those early. This beast, as well as the Vivid Vulture that we're going to talk about in a second, is a special beast that only comes from the Einhar memory of Harvest Memory, something like that. One of the boss beasts, and what it does is, by guarantee adding a meta modifier, remember, suffixes can't be changed is the only prefix meta modifier. So if we have full suffixes, no matter what, it gives us suffixes can't be changed. So if you craft your item suffixes first, you can use a Wild Bristle Matron to, instead of spending the two divines every single time on the crafting bench, you can do this for a cheaper price. It's always going to cost less than two divines, but you can see it's getting closer to it. Earlier league, the price is lower. This is a way that you can save at time of recording 0.7 divines per reroll. And if you're doing some advanced crafting, this is a way that you can save yourself a lot of money if you're doing a lot of rerolls on an item. So let's remove the suffixes can't be changed from these boots and we'll show that we can put it back on. 
This is really the only use for it. I don't think there's ever a time that you would use a Wild Bristle Matron with full prefixes and you want to randomly get one of the other modifiers, especially the price of this is set. Like there's a two out of four chance that you get a, a craft that's gonna cost you one divine, cannot roll uh, attack or cannot roll caster. So <laughs> there's a 50% chance that you actually get a one divine craft versus a two divine craft. So this doesn't work out monetarily for that, but it will guarantee put suffixes can't be changed on this boot, full suffixes, and the only prefix meta mod is suffixes can't be changed. And there we go. So that's the use of it. If you want to just keep doing re-rolling on your prefixes, anything like that, protect your suffixes. You just buy a bunch of Wild Bristle Matrons and you can do this over and over again. So that's the use of that there. Last up is we're going to show the Vivid Vulture right here. It re-rolls a Synthesis Implicit Modifier. Out of the three here, it can re-roll any of the three Implicit Modifiers on this wand. And so this is what people do to make the best items in the entire game. So for example, if you had this synthesized bow and you had the attack speed and the physical damage on the implicits, but you didn't have that physical damage, what you can do, remember you can use uh, the Krasic Chimera, you can imprint, and you can just use the Vivid Vulture over, and uh, yeah, you'll, you're gonna, and I did this last league, it takes a lot, <laughs> you do it a lot. But you can do that until you get that final, like one out of three times, it'll reroll one of those implicits. Pick the one that you wanted to reroll, one out of three times. And you just keep doing an imprint Rerolling, imprint rerolling until that third implicit is the one that you're looking for. And that's how you can make you know, these really crazy items with perfect implicits that are just insane out of this world. And I'll show you guys a really quick example of, uh, of what you can do. So the idea here is we're trying to craft the base of the item. So we would actually scour this item. There was nothing really crafted on it. We make the item blue and then we do a Krasic Chimeral right here. We make our imprint first. I'm already getting <laughs> PTSD from doing this last league. So we get our imprint right here. We have our item right here. If we were really going to do this, we would buy like 30 Krasic Chimerals and 100 Vivid Vultures. And then we do reroll Synthesis Implicit, right? I really like the damage per intelligence. I like the chaos damage, but I really don't like that chaos res. Let's see if we reroll it. And what it's going to do is it's going to reroll one of those three Implicits. There we go. If we're doing some sort of like int stacking, strength stacking, hybrid setup thing, there might be something usable here. But if we didn't like that attack damage, we can use the imprint, we can go back in time and rewind it to where it was. Then we can make another imprint. We're just gonna do this twice. You can see the pain, right? You can see how this adds up because there's a ton of implicits. There's so many that you can get. We're gonna roll a vivid again. See if we get lucky. All right, boom, super lucky. There we go, that's the mod we're looking for. We got light radius, goaded. So we got Light Radius, we're super happy. We got the best wand in the entire video game. Nothing's gonna compare to that. Offers are open, guys. If you want that Light Radius wand, let me know. It's really good to see, you know, it's a ray class, some of those dungeons, very dark. Very useful to see with your uh, in stacking build. After you hit the perfect thing, you hit exactly what you want, you do not want to accidentally use the imprint, right? Like, cause the imprint will rewind. Like you put all that work into it and you don't want to ever accidentally click it. And the thing is, you can't, you can't drop an imprint. It's actually, you can destroy it. <laughs> All right, you can destroy it, but you can't drop it. So you can type slash destroy, but the other thing is you can sell it to a vendor and it'll give you a regret orb. So you can do that as well. When you're done crafting your item and you hit exactly what you want, strongly recommend destroying or selling those imprints because you don't want to ever accidentally risk it because you know you could be partying one night out with the, out with the boys and then you get home and you're just like, oh my God, I can't wait to just log into Path of Exile. And then you just drunkenly use an imprint and then there went uh, uh, 500 divines of crafting. All right, and last up, splitting. So what this does is you put in a rare item that does not have the split tag and it creates two items that have half of the mods on both. So if you have five mods on your item that you put in, you will get back an item that has three and an item that has two. If you have three and three, then if you have six mods, you'll get back a three and three. And the rarity of those items will also be commensurate with how many mods are on there. So if it has two or one mods on the item, it will become a magic item. But if it has three mods, it will still be a rare item. So the name of this beast is the Fenimal Plague Directed. For splitting an item, it does not work on influenced, fractured, synthesized, unique, mirrored, or corrupted items. Items with catalyst quality or enchants and specifically items with a split modifier. However, it does work with items that have Eldritch implicit modifiers as they're not considered influenced. 
but it does split the Eldritch Implicits. So you'll get one with Searing Exarch and one of Eater of World. And then the big thing that I said earlier is when you split an item, it actually changes what the item is. The item, uh, the number, like that one, two, three number, that one, two, three, four number that is in the database that is linked to that item, it will change because it makes two new items based on the previous item. The previous item is effectively destroyed. So you can no longer use imprints when you split an item. However, the base of the item will be the same. So the big thing that splitting used to be used for is for maintaining six link items. People would craft like perfect six, you know, six white socket, six linked items, and then they would split them and then they could sell them for a profit. So splitting isn't done nearly as much as it used to be, you know, back in the day. The most valuable items these days, like I said, are generally synthesized or fractured items that people craft up. And so you don't see split items too much these days. All right, but just an example of how it works. We, uh, we got the Fenimal Plague Directing right here, half the mods on each item. We'll see that it has two red and one green socket like this. And you can see what the mods are on it. It's got five mods. So we should have a two and a three. So you'll notice we actually don't see one of the items because my loot filter is hiding it. So one of the items stays here inside the bench. It has two modifiers right here. So because it kept two prefixes, it actually stayed rare. If it had a prefix and a suffix, I believe it would turn magic. Because of two prefixes, it has to be a rare item. It stayed a rare item. And then this one down here has all of the rest of the modifiers. It has uh, one of the prefixes and two of the suffixes. You'll see because it gained the split tag right here. Because of that, I cannot split it again. Target, target is split. So you can only split an item once, but it keeps the same base. It keeps the same sockets, all of that. But again, it can't be used on a lot of things. Influence, fractured, synthesized, unique. Uh, if it has any quality, if it has any enchants, anything like that. Like I said, it's not the most commonly done thing in the game anymore. The only thing that I know people still use it for is blueprints because, you know, really good blueprints can be kind of rare and the split beast can be kind of cheap. I think that that is it for beast crafting. And I think that that's going to be it for us today. This one's been a long time coming. I hope that this really brings everything together. Again, this is foundational material that is trying to ease you into the next stage of crafting. I hope you enjoyed the previous video. Um, I hope you enjoyed this one. I hope you learned a lot. I tried to cut a really good swath of you know, my knowledge bases I've gained over the past handful of years playing this game. I've crafted some really big items in the game right now. I, I always craft pretty much all of my gear for all of my builds. It's it's something that I really care about and I it really opens up the game for me and I think it really helps you personalize your build opens up so much ability to profit, craft, anything like that. The depth of the game, the depth of crafting the game is one of the biggest things that really keeps bringing me back to the game and why I like it so much. Thank you all for watching all the way through this monumental video and thank you for subscribing and the patrons and all you guys for keeping this channel alive and really appreciate you guys. And uh, I'm gonna go edit this very long video and I hope you enjoy. See ya.